movie set. You're used to this, I'm not. No. <laughs> Oh, that's what, what is yeah, that for? Suppose, yeah, yeah, I suppose. That's right for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm telling you. I'm make sure I don't get out a letter <laughs> from <laughs> Tom Comer's <laughs> to... It's too bright. Publicity, yeah. Do you need this much light? Do we need this I don't much know. light? I don't know. I'm a surprise. Oh, I'm surprised. Watch my mic. Yes, uh, we should start. Mike. Fifteen twenty. Yeah, we we're supposed to, we we have two hours. Okay, we'll try to give you know some time for discussion. Okay, maybe I should start. Good afternoon. Welcome to this symposium, sponsored by the Harvard Institute for International Development, in honor of Dwight Perkins. In June, Dwight stepped down as director of HIID after fifteen years of outstanding leadership a period during which the Institute expanded beyond all expectations to become one of the leading development centers in the world. Dwight came to development about 30 years ago uh, with a lively intellect, one that challenges conventional and especially complacent thinking, and with intellectual roots deep in the ancient and modern history of the world's longest live civilization, China. He then came to HIID just over 15 years ago with a commitment to making a difference in the welfare of millions who live in less developed countries, and with an understanding of how a great university, Harvard, could make a contribution in, to the practice as well as to the theory of development. It is this combination of intellectual vigor, long-term vision, commitment, and practical understanding that motivates today's symposium. The title of the symposium is Reinventing Development. The theme grows out of dramatic changes in the world economy over the past decade or so. The growing consensus that open economies and well-functioning markets can promote development better than intervening governments. The remarkable growth of seven nations, I guess I would make it eight, in East and Southeast Asia. Uh, the dramatic collapse of world communism. The unprecedented shift towards democracy in Latin America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe and the closer integration of the world economy, its trade, its financial markets, and its communications. Most of us view these revolutionary developments as unquestionably beneficial for most of humankind. But for all the promise of a new age, it is not hard to find dangers of instability and regress. We see threats to the new order in the fragility of our environment, in the revitalized tribalism of Eastern Europe Africa and South Asia, in the sudden punishment that an unforgiving world market can inflict on mismanaged economies, even temporarily mis mismanaged economies such as Mexico's, and in the forces of nativism and reaction that seem not far from power in most countries of the world. It will take shrewd, skilled management at all levels, local, national, and international, to make the most of our new opportunities and to avoid the pitfalls of reaction and instability. These issues lie at the center of our Institute's concerns. To contribute to the greater understanding of economic, political, and social management in this new era, HIID will sponsor a major two-day development conference each October with invited papers on selected themes of broad interest. This symposium, in honor of Dwight Perkins then, may be considered the first of what we hope will be an annual event. However, my task this afternoon is to introduce this symposium and its four distinguished speakers. Jeffrey Sachs to my left, Michael Chege to his left, Jessica Einhorn to his left, and the empty chair is Larry Summers, who is either on an airplane or at the airport or possibly in a taxi cab, and we hope we'll make it here at some point. Uh, each will speak for about 15 or 20 minutes after which we will open the floor to questions or discussion. Towards the end of the symposium, I'll ask each of the speakers to sum up if they wish to. The first speaker will be Jeffrey Sachs. Professor Sachs has been at Harvard as student and faculty member since 1972. He is the Galen L. Stone Professor of International Economics, and in July, he succeeded Dwight Perkins as director of HIID. 
Jeff is internationally known as an advisor to the economic leaders of several governments in Latin America, Asia, Eastern Europe, and the former Soviet Union. He has advised on and made contributions to our thinking about the transition from socialist to market economies, the international debt crisis, the international coordination of macroeconomic policies, and the economic management of both developing and developed countries. Professor Sachs. Thank you very much. You can see the best part of being director is that your colleagues have to say such nice things about you. Uh, so I'm extremely uh, honored to be here. I'm extremely uh, honored uh, by the chance to follow uh, Dwight Perkins' remarkable leadership uh, in the position as a director of the Harvard Institute for International Development. Dwight, uh, for 15 years, exercised remarkable judgment uh, and remarkable intellectual leadership to make HID an institution of great respect and I think importance around the world. And I can say since becoming director, I've had the great pleasure to visit a number of our projects in Vietnam, in Zambia, uh, in Russia, and without a question and with uh, absolutely uh, no, uh, no compliment to me or no responsibility or contribution from me, uh, I can say that these projects uh, are making a difference uh, and uh, Dwight's leadership is absolutely clear uh, and deep in these projects and it's, it's an extraordinary personal opportunity for me uh, and a great privilege uh, to be able to follow and work in this tradition. And uh, I also look forward to working with Dwight, who uh, remains uh, with HID very actively uh, in, uh, in future years. Our topic today is the world. Uh, nothing less than the world, but that's all right. They've given me 15 minutes for it. Uh, I did want to cover two centuries, if you'll permit me. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit of a quick tour of the issue of uh, international development which is a, a great theme, perhaps the greatest theme uh, in social science and uh, perhaps the greatest human challenge that we face uh, on the planet. As Mike Romer told you, the amount of change underway right now, and as you know from your daily lives, the amount of change underway in problems of development, in political management, in thinking about societies, I think one can say is greater now and more rapid now than in any time in history. I'm, I'm told that every generation believes that, but objectively speaking, within the last 10 years, the number of democracies has risen from 54 to 108, according to the count of Freedom House. The number of people living in countries that are professing to undertake market economic reforms numbers about three and a half billion people in the world. It's not just the collapse of communism, it's the unbelievably revolutionary change from military dictatorship and autarkic development in Latin America to nearly universal democracy and market economics in Latin America. Similarly, a dramatic change can be found in all parts of the world. And fortunately, as Michael Chege, I'm sure, will tell us, with very significant and potentially enormously positive developments in Africa as well, the continent that is most struggling uh, with the, the gravest uh, crisis uh, of uh, development today. So the question is how to make sense of this, and the more specific question for me is how to make sense of this in 12 minutes that remain. And I have to warn you, as I'm sure our discerning students uh, always know, that there's a difference of trying to give an explanation and really having deep understanding uh, of the question. I will try to explain. You can judge uh, how well I'm doing. I am reminded of this distinction between mere explanation and real understanding by the purported telephone conversation that uh, recently took place in Moscow when uh, President Yeltsin called uh, the prime minister and uh, said, uh, Viktor Stepanovich, I just don't understand our economic policy. 
And, the, pre and uh, the Prime Minister responded, well, Boris Nikolaevich, I can explain it to you. The President answered, no, no, I can explain it, I just don't understand it. <laughs> so, I'm going to explain it. We'll have a panel discussion about whether I or any of us really understands the amount of change underway in the world. Strangely, the starting point uh, for our discussion really should be 150 years ago, and it should be with the most ardent, fervent believer in the dynamism of capitalism that has probably ever lived and written. And of, of course, I'm speaking of none other than Karl Marx, uh, who in the Communist Manifesto gives the greatest panegyrics uh, to capitalism that can be found in any substantial writing in the world because Marx was living through the Industrial Revolution, and more importantly, he was living through the period when capitalism first burst forth from Europe and confronted the rest of the world. And I just want to read one paragraph because I think it helps to explain something about where we are right now. So Marx and Engels, it's, it's the best prediction they made in an otherwise uh, kind of mixed up a tome, but uh, Marx uh, wrote that, quote, the bourgeoisie, by the rapid improvement of all instruments of production, by the immensely facilitated means of communication, draws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilization. The cheap prices of its commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all Chinese walls, with which it forces the barbarians' intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate. It compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst, i.e., to become bourgeois themselves. In one word, it creates a world after its own image. I wouldn't put it exactly this way uh, if I were describing the process, but I think Marx sensed something of profound significance and raised a puzzle, which is a great puzzle for all economists, social scientists, uh, social thinkers. What Marx understood was that capitalism was by far the most dynamic economic system that had ever been invented, and I think it's an observation that by far remains true today. He predicted, therefore, that it would compel all nations to remold themselves in its image, because no alternative system could remotely produce that level of economic productivity. I think that that's essentially right as well. Of course, the uh, intervening 150 years since that was written have been among the most bloody, tumultuous, uh, and anything but even record uh, in the history of our planet. And there's a paradox here, I think. Marx was essentially right, I would say. Capitalism was the most dynamic system. It would behoove countries to adopt it. It didn't happen smoothly. And it's only, I believe, now that we are witnessing what Marx, in essence, predicted 150 years ago. Let me explain very briefly. The initial confrontations between capitalism and the world were a deeply uneven and deeply immoral match. The Industrial Revolution had put the military and industrial power of the capitalist world so far ahead of the rest that what occurred in the next 75 years, by and large, was colonialism, military domination, social and political domination. Capitalism by 1900 had spread to the world, but to a world of colonial capitalism. It was global capitalism 100 years ago. Uh, indeed, we had the internet of 1890. That was laying the telegraph lines around the world. And the exuberance uh, was about the same as today. In fact, the end of history was the popular theory of 1911, when Norman Angel wrote the famous bestseller of the time, The Illusion of War, claiming that war was over uh, because it would be too costly. Good timing. It was a bestseller uh, for three years. Uh, uh, but so he made a major mistake. But the point is that the first burst of capitalism was hugely productive because the growth in the world at the end of the 19th century was the fastest growth in all of history, as Kuznets taught us many years ago in his monumental studies of modern economic growth. It was unprecedented. The spread of capitalism did what Marx said, but it had spread in a deeply immoral way and in an unstable way. And that contributed, although I'm skipping about 18 volumes and, uh, and several lecture courses of debate, it contributed to World War I, 
It contributed to the inability to find global cooperation in the interwar period. That contributed to the financial debacles and crisis of the 1930s and to the end of Europe's 30-year war, the Second World War, which uh, brought us to 1945 in a world that whatever the lessons of capitalism might have been on the economic side was a world that wasn't much impressed with the record of the preceding generations. And what's important for us to understand about what's happening today is that today we are living through the end of a world created by the leaders of the immediate post-war era. And that's why we're undergoing the kind of change that's occurring today, in my opinion. As colonialism ended, as the new nations came uh, into independence, all over the world, the builders of the new nations rejected capitalism as a method of state organization. Mr. Nehru, who had campaigned on the Gandhian call for self-sufficiency, and whose country had been occupied not just by Britain, but by a multinational company, the East India Company, for the first 250 years after the East India Company representatives arrived in 1600, this was a man not much interested in international trade or foreign direct investment. And so the Nehruvian socialist model was a model of state-led non-market development closed to the world as a vehicle for creating the state, for creating a society, and most importantly, keeping the hated foreigners out. And the reasons for hatred were clear enough. But it was a model that was understandable in social, historical, political terms. It was just a lousy economic model. Because if he had read Marx better, he would have understood that he was choosing a weak, distant sixth cousin to reasonable economics, not something that could be highly productive for the Indian economy. Nehru's choice, similar to Ataturk's choice, similar to Nasser's choice in Egypt in 1952, similar to Sukarno's choice, similar to Juan Perón's choice in Argentina, to Getulio Vargas in Brazil, and to many, many other nation builders, Nerire, Nkrumah, many of the leaders of socialist attempts in Africa. Perfectly understandable why these choices were made. Just the problem, they hadn't read their marks carefully enough. They chose the wrong system. And what we're observing, I think, in a nutshell, and uh, my time is really running out, what we're observing is the end of that era. The state model lasted for 30 years. What it gave in the end was not just stagnation. That would have been bad enough, but that already came in the 60s for these countries, not in the 80s. What it produced was something far more dramatic, and that was bankruptcy of the state in literal financial terms. So about 65 developing countries around the world went into Chapter 11 as it were, couldn't pay their bills, pleaded for mercy, ended up with the greatest wave of hyperinflation in all of world history in the 1980s. And of course, the most remarkable confrontation ideologically, the most dangerous in world history, the Cold War, ended not, thank God, in the final Armageddon uh, over ideology. We wouldn't be here today if it had but mercifully, remarkably, surprisingly, simply in the receivership of the Soviet Union, which went belly up financially in 1991 and led to the collapse of the regime. Where are we now? Most importantly, we are in a period of great opportunity, though great danger and flux, as all moments of opportunity are. The old model failed tragically. It left countries bankrupt. It left societies in despair, in anguish, sometimes in utter desperation. But it also has given the opportunity for vastly more sensible strategies of development. And the most important piece of sense is that in order to develop, a country must be part of the world in the fullest sense, in the sense, most importantly, of ideas, 
of science, of culture, but also trade, investment, flows of goods and services and people. And we have, by virtue of the end of autarky, the end of state-led development, we have a chance really to put together a global community, not based on colonial domination as 100 years ago, but based at least in a fragile way on the chance for the rule of law. Last year, in what is surely not only about the most important international legal text in economics uh, ever written, also the most boring, uh, the Uruguay round was completed and the World Trade Organization was established. Only a few of uh, the crazy people in this room actually have read through the thing. Uh, but uh, it is a thousands of pages of codification of, that essentially reflects an international rule of law, if we can hold it if we can learn to live with it, if we can learn to live in open societies and with mutual respect and with commitment to the rule of law. So I think the challenge for all developing countries now is in the short run, or for many, is overcoming extreme, uh, extreme financial bankruptcy. That's been the tragedy and the drama of the last few years. But the much greater challenge is learning to live in the world together. That's a challenge for both sides of the divide between developed and developing countries. And the divide is not sharp and uh, not even identifiable in many cases. We're all in this together. It's going to take a remarkable spirit of cooperation and openness intellectually. Ideas will be profoundly important because we are at this such a pregnant moment in history. Uh, and uh, one that I think if we devote ourselves steadfastly to the task, we have a chance of building great things in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. The second speaker is Michael Chege. Michael's a gifted social scientist who's been an important and sometimes critical commenter on African development over the years. Dr. Chege received his PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley and taught at the University of Nairobi in his home country, Kenya. In 1988, he became a program officer for the Ford Foundation in Harare, Zimbabwe, in charge of public policy and international affairs, where he dealt with a number of issues, research on economic reform, regional integration, administrative capacity building in governments and non-governmental organizations, and staff training in universities. Michael has written extensively on democratization and politics in Africa. He is currently visiting scholar at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard, working on a book manuscript on governance and the development crisis in Africa. Michael Chege. Thank you very much, Professor Roma. Knowing Mike, I don't know whether his kind introduction has got anything to do with it being Friday the 13th, <laughs> but, but I appreciate it all the same. First, uh, I'm greatly honored to have been asked to speak at this panel in honor of Dwight Perkins today. This panel honors a lawyer friend of the Third World Development, a devotee to HIID programs, not just in many countries in the world, but particularly, I, I like to mention, in my, own, in my own country, Kenya. And above all, it honors a decent human being. Reinventing development, which was chosen, the chosen topic for our discussion this, this evening, uh, is of practical application for me to a subject of more than academic interest to those who come from countries like mine. For not only do I come from a developing region with the bleakest prospects of economic development at the moment, as Jeffrey Sachs just mentioned, but I've been personally involved in that process from the most micro of micro levels, that is, growing up in a rural household in central Kenya, but also at the most macro of macro levels, that is, the international development family of, that includes the international foundations, the IFIs, and of course, least, uh, not least fortuitously, the Harvard Institute for International Development. As for me, and for me, the emerging, though not as, as yet, there was yet incomplete consensus on the international repertoire of um, promoting economic development is something of a, of a life-saving device 
That is the primacy of market forces, greater breathing space for private enterprise, the sanctity of macroeconomic stability, openness in global trade, a sound infrastructure, and above all, investment in human resources. As governments around the world now seek to follow the trail blazed by Southeast Asia and try to find a way to the bra brave new world of, ec of, of economic development that is promised by this combination of policies, we must be constantly on guard against a relapse into the old ways of state control. Again, the, the, the ones that Jeff just mentioned of state control of markets and plain license in macroeconomic policies. Introducing a recent book uh, called Voting for Reform, which I just finished reading, Oren Summers, who was on a panel tonight, was saying that if communism is the surest way to destroy an economy and bombing is the second best way, uh, then surely a rampant populism ranks a close third. For six years, I lived in Zimbabwe next door to Mozambique in Southern Africa. And Mozambique is a beautiful country with an ugly and exploitative colonial past of the Portuguese. After independence in 1975, the Mozambique government tried to do not one, but all three of the above. Scientific socialism, bombing uh, MNR rebels, and macroeconomic populism. Today, she ranks at the bottom of the, de of the Development League in the world, per capita income of $90. I know all too well that the Portuguese have got some explanation to do here, but the policies too. And yet, and yet, hope can blossom in the middle of ruin. After peace and economic liberalization, the agricultural sector in Mozambique in the last year grew by an estimated 20%. For the sake of this brief presentation, I want to take the consensus on the primacy of markets as a given. Very often it is institutions in the market world of the social factors that have underpinned development that tend to be taken for granted. And the social institutions is a field which economics following the line of least mathematical resistance often takes for granted or as given. In an often repeated statement, Professor Robert Solo, to whose pioneering work on growth we are all indebted, is reputed to have said that explanations on different rates of growth between countries or between regions and countries reduce all of us into amateur sociologists. Every time I've read this statement, my own conscience has smiled at me and said, aha, he's talking about you. <laughs> so let me be honest with you and don my own cup as an amateur sociologist and look at social institutions because I think if we really accept the primacy of markets, I think the challenge of the, growing, the coming decade and of the coming century is going to be how we put in place the institutional framework in these developing societies so as to make growth sustained, sustainable, and also popularly accepted. Given the time I have, I'll just zero in at four factors that I've selected arbitrarily. One, governance and the need for a civic culture, and two, an insulated cadre of technocratic reformers. Uh, three, openness, not just in external, uh, in external trade, but also in the world of ideas. And finally, the issue of leadership. In a study of, nations, of why nations regress economically at an accelerating rate, which is a subject we don't hear very much about, Professor Amartya Sen of this university did some regression analysis on countries that grow backwards. A lot of these are in my country. And, and he was saying, people don't look at this very often. And I said, hey, I'm interested because I know that experience. And he was saying that to the extent that one can read any lessons from this, it is the following. That the greatest explanatory factor that explains why countries regress is political instability militarism, an incapacity to hold together in the level of governance and to create institutions that sustain political stability. You will notice that in espousing this position, I have deliberately given wide berth to the mantra of democracy as a tonic for democracy, uh, democracy as a tonic for economic growth, 
which has acquired a sustained uh, uh, a sanctity in uh, international developing agencies, particularly in, in my part of the world. It is not that I'm against democracy, democracy for heaven's sake. I am for it. But throughout the many time series, de uh, time series analysis and cross-section data that I've seen try to correlate democracy and economic growth, I've seen no conviction whatsoever that one causes the other, or, or at least that politics or political participation causes development. I want to support democracy because it is right, and it is morally right, not because it produces 1% growth rate higher than other systems. And I think that is a good reason in and of itself. The second factor, insulated technocratic elites. Uh, this comes to us in such terms as embedded autonomy, which is what Peter Evans has been talking about recently, if you've seen his growth on uh, his book on uh, electronics industries in India, uh, Brazil, etc., as well as what John Williamson of the Institute of International Economics down in Washington, D.C., called the role of technopoles, technocrats with a strong sensitivity to politics. I do not want to go into the details of how you produce technopoles and technopoles and sustain them, except to mention that obviously this has a lot to do with the manner of the capacity of national leadership to tolerate technocratic advice that is sound, and to marry it with overall political objectives of the country. Uh, I've mentioned the role of external ideas and external trade. I will not cite, cite any scholars here. I want to cite my own personal experience. Growing up in central Kenya in the 1950s, smallholders in my part of the world, uh, three, four, five acres, if, if anybody had eight or 10 acres, it was considered to be very well to do, were allowed, after years of political agitation and violence, to, produ to produce crops that are, that are sold to the external markets, primarily coffee, rather tea, and dairy products. Fortuitously for us, it was possible to, to erect institutional framework that took very little uh, from the final sales by way of middlemen as well as uh, government. The result is that Households did extremely well. In a recent survey of household budgets in, uh, in central Kenya, in the height of the coffee boom in the 1970s, Paul Collier, who is of Oxford University and of Harvard at once, detected with his colleagues 70% savings rate among smallholders. Our government uh, was consuming about the same proportion. The smallholders were saving even much more and putting this into education, into household construction, and so on, and improving farm gear. I would like to hear what the savings ratio of rural Massachusetts is in the boom years of the Dukakis administration. <laughs> Leadership. A crude summary I will, I, will, I will enter into here, again, given the limitation of time, is the following that passed a certain threshold, the drive for individual enterprise, individual market-driven uh, uh, activities, reach a threshold in which institutions become a constraint. To put it differently, individual enterprises and investment yields diminishing returns because institutions broadly defined, act as a constraint. The law of leadership here, to m in my view, is one of divining when that moment is reached and to put in place the institutional reforms that need to be carried and which will always, whether you're talking about the United States or China or Kenya or South Africa or Egypt, be resisted by a vast majority of people and particularly those who have vested interest in the old ways who derive rents from them in one way or another. Think of a good leader as a conductor of an orchestra who knows not just the individual technical noise and sound that comes from the wind, string, instruments, etc., but also something about how they blend together. And indeed, we're supposed to have two years, I was always told, that look back to the audience to divine what the effect they're likely to have. One who understands the internal, in, if you like, technically speaking, endogenous variable that go into growth as well as the external ones. It is both an art as well as a, as an art as well as a science. 
Most of all, one calls for leaders that really want reform and, that en and who enjoy seeing reform done and that can convince their, 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 their followership that this is the way to get done. When you have leaders who get sulky and who get a, a long face every time reforms are advocated by the technocrats with the response, oh, well, can this wait? Uh, does it have to be done before the elections? This is the problem that you see ourselves running into again and again. I believe that this is something that we as Africans can learn from other places as well. The capacity of leadership that combines markets, that combines institutions, that seeks to create a creative policy environment that can convince the public and the nation that it is good for them to move ahead. No example suffices here much better than that of uh, the role that Nelson Mandela has played in South Africa. And, for my, and from my own point of view, having lived in that part of the world at its most, at its most difficult moment, understand and appreciate all too well the role that he has played, including on the issues that we are talking about here this evening. Most recently, he was quoted as following, and I want to share this quotation with you, that certainly colonialism and the selfish ordering of world affairs, past and present, have undermined African development, but Africa has now traversed a mindset that seeks to heap all blame on the past and on others. The era of renaissance that we are entering is and should be based on our own eff efforts as Africans to change Africans' conditions for the better. The cue and the clue here is one of individual responsibility. The world matters, it sure does. It can be benign, it can also be hostile, but at the end of the day, it is what we, our own leaders, and we as technocrats do to confront these situations. I believe that, as I said in the beginning, by and large, we have the intellectual repertoire and the tools that we need to transcend this difficult threshold in this coming century. Let's get down to work. Thank you very much, Michael. Our third speaker is Jessica Einhorn, Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank. Mrs. Einhorn, a graduate of Barnard College, holds a PhD in politics from Princeton. Before joining the World Bank, she worked in international monetary affairs and development finance in both the State Department and the Treasury of the US. As World Bank Treasurer, Mrs. Einhorn raises about $10 billion a year. Read it and weep, Jeff. <laughs> on international markets and manages a portfolio of almost $100 billion. She has been an innovator in finding or adapting new instruments of finance to help the World Bank continue its lending activities. Jessica Einhorn. If I can, I'm going to step off the stage just to shake hands and meet my person. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Mike Chege has just shown us how impressive it can be to speak from personal experience. My sense, though, was that when Joe Stern wrote to me and spoke to me on the phone, he didn't really want me to speak to you about my personal experiences, about how you do a global bond or how you manage 30 billion in liquidity. So instead, what I'm going to do today is speak to you as a student, a student in another, I hope, great institution of development learning which is the World Bank. And I'll say at the beginning that I have a teacher here to grade me, as usual, because um, I was on the research committee when Larry Summers joined the World Bank as the vice president for development economics and obviously our spokesman. And I have no doubt that Larry will continue to tell me where I have it wrong, but it's nice <laughs> to be here. I am honored to be here today and delighted to have the honor uh, to pay tribute to Dwight Perkins for his work as director of the Harvard Institute for International Development. Combining academic excellence with institutional leadership presents an enormous challenge, but one which I hear from my colleagues at the bank, Dwight Perkins has thoroughly mastered. Not only has he continued to be extraordinarily prolific, both in the area he pioneered, Chinese agriculture, where he remains a touchstone for anyone studying that field today, and in the whole area of Chinese economic reform. But in other areas, and then in fundraising, 
something that a treasurer would notice. I notice, for example, from the Institute's biennial report that you have taken the budget from 1980 to today from 4 million to over 35 million. And I'll leave it to Jeff to see whether he can uh, continue that exponential growth. <laughs> I'd also like to add one personal note then before I speak of thanks to Dwight Perkins on behalf of the World Bank, which owes you a considerable debt for helping to introduce us to China at a time when our thinking was certainly not at the cutting edge. You have been our Mr. China, as you have been for any, many others, and we are extremely grateful for it. Changing mindsets does bring me to the theme today then, perhaps best encapsulated under the title, The Agenda for Development, The Role of Knowledge. Learning has been instrumental both in setting the development agenda and in defining the role of the bank. Development economics, as most of you know, is no more a pure science than economics as a whole. We might prefer it if it were, and certainly our work would be a lot easier. But if we're honest, we would admit that had we not been open to learning, we would have been a lot less successful. And certainly important problems, far from being solved, would have actually become, as Michael was telling us, intractable. If we take a minute to look where we have come from, our own transition as development economists at the bank has been quite remarkable. From an emphasis on investment projects to sectors, from a unique focus on physical infrastructure and industry to a broadened focus on rural and urban areas, from a belief that the benefits of economic growth would filter down to the poor to an appreciation that reducing poverty requires strategies very specifically directed to the poor. From an orientation toward state-led industrialization to the fostering of private enterprise. From a top-down to a bottom-up approach and back around to an unavoidable circle. And from the aggressive exploitation of natural resources, sorry to say, to today where we stand four square for ensuring sustainable development. Perhaps most striking from an emphasis on the provision of physical capital to an understanding that providing quality of life for the poorest, as Michael was telling us, access to education, health, and nutrition has enormous economic returns. And with that understanding, a recognition of the importance of investing in people. Michael was saying that democracy is good for itself and that he doesn't have to link it to economic growth. But at the bank, we came to education, health, and population, not because of the intrinsic quality of those uh, items for human life, important though they may be, but because of the high economic rate of return. And if I can say for one moment, one of the bravest moments and one of the uh, most historic for us during Larry's tenure was when he went to Pakistan and stood in front of an audience of ministers and others and said that the single highest economic rate of return that Pakistan could have, bar any other, was investing in the education of young girls. Um, <laughs> if we look at the world around us, move away from the World Bank, the learning process has been no less dramatic. 50 years of economists manning ideological barricades have been replaced by an unprecedented degree of consensus about the importance of the market, macroeconomic stability, and free trade. Indeed, that consensus is so strong that as I sit on the podium today and, in, and look at the people hanging from the uh, balconies, for Dwight Perkins, certainly not for us, I can't help thinking that we must be uh, moving beyond where we think it is. In other words, there must be students out there who are going to disagree if all four of us from very different uh, walks of life and experiences are coming up with the same point of view. But after 50 years of experience, we know from empirical knowledge, we do not need development theory to tell us that the best prospects for development emerge from the synergy that takes place when governments invest in physical and human infrastructure and then make way for the private sector. Uh, this has been no ivory tower conversion. Governments throughout the world have adopted market-friendly approaches with significant results. China, where annual growth has averaged close to 10 percent for the past 15 years. India, which is projected to grow at 6 percent for the rest of the decade. Latin America, where growth rates in the last several years are double 
from what they were in the 1980s. And the economies in transition, such as Albania and Poland, who now rank, am I right, Jeff, among the fastest growing countries in Europe. And there has also been revolutionary change in the developing nation's role in the global economy. In the first three years of this decade, developing nations accounted for 70% of global GDP growth and 50% of the growth in world trade. A quarter of industrial country exports and 15 million jobs in this country and in other industrial countries now depend on trade with developing countries. 25 countries have already graduated from needing the bank system, assistance. So where does that leave the World Bank? Last year, the volume of long-term capital going to the developing countries reached almost $230 billion equivalent, with fi official financing making up only about 25% of that. As more and more countries welcomely graduate from uh, IBRD assistance, World Bank assistance, and as those capital flows increase, are we putting ourselves out of business? a discussion maybe that we can have a little later on. I personally believe, and I sincerely believe, that it is quite the opposite. That far from reaching imminent redundancy, the World Bank is, is on the threshold, to overuse the word, of a challenging new era. In developed and developing countries alike, governments are, and citizens are thinking through two related fundamental questions. What is the proper role of government in a market economy and at what level of government uh, are these activities most properly performed? From Gingrich's contract to the EU, the Economic Union's subsidiarity, to political reform in Japan, these questions are being debated. Increasingly, we know today what works economically. We know that it's not simply the market or the state that delivers, but the synergy, as I said before, between them that a market-friendly economy where the state sets the legal and regulatory environment, ensures compliance, establishes the foundation for macroeconomic stability, and invests in people, offers extraordinary potential, as we have witnessed in many parts of East Asia over the last decade. We know, too, that in many parts of the world, it is no longer an issue, we can no longer say it's an issue of the availability of capital although certainly when it comes to concessional funds, we would all agree that governments continue to need to do their part. Private capital flows to the developing countries have quadrupled so far this decade, reaching, as you all know, more than 170 billion reportedly last year. And even with the effects of the Mexican crisis, many of us would bet strongly that investor interest in, the partic in participating in the growth potential of the developing world will come back and is coming back vigorously. Nevertheless, despite the increased availability of capital in the last few years and a recognition of the ingredients for development, the actual record of development has been patchy. Why? Time and again, the answer to that question is the same. Whether one is talking about banking systems, privatization, education, infrastructure financing, or growth and poverty reduction, the answer is relatively simple, because the state and civic institutions necessary to enable the market to work, as Michael was saying and as Jeff has been saying, are not in place or operate poorly. We see it in much of Latin America when we talk about banking. We see it in the transition economies when we talk about privatization. And we see it in Africa and South Asia when we talk about growth. The examples are legion, the recent Venezuelan banking crisis, which threw both the economy and political life of the country into upheaval and had everything to do with inadequate regulatory frameworks, undermined by institutional frameworks that made it easy to use the banking system for political ends. One country in Africa recapitalized several failed banks and removed the managers, only to reinstate those same managers in several other banks. We see it in privately financed power generation, where investors have located power plants on barges offshore to protect against price and expropriation risks in the absence of good regulatory and judicial institutions. We saw it in Argentina, where the government laudably 
privatized its telecommunication systems into two com uh, companies. But my understanding is that they received less than half the present value of the earning of these two companies because of fears of expropriation. And we see it in country after country where transparency, predictability, and consistency, transparency, predictability, and consistency in the application of rules simply do not exist. We have had remarkable success in designing market-friendly policies, in telling governments what the state should not be doing. But clearly, this is not enough. To quote Dwight Perkins, and I quote, I hope accurately, a belief in markets and indirect incentives is not the same as laissez-faire economies or a policy of always minimizing the role of government, unquote. The challenge in the future is to map out the role of the state. I would go even further and say that the challenge of the future is to reinvent the state, not the monolithic economic provider, but as market enabler, regulator, arbiter, guarantor of property rights, in combination with the state's more traditional role as provider of education, health, and nutrition, of safety nets to cushion the poor while the economic adjustment takes hold. And even in those provisions of rights, the bank is putting out research now talking about bringing in the private sector in the form of NGOs and others to take over those traditional or share in those traditional provisions of services. In short, our task, your task, is to help design the development state. This is a challenge of enormous importance. In a world today, one with one billion people, whatever that means, I use that a lot and I know it minimizes people to talk about billions, but one billion people still struggle to survive on a dollar a day. Two billion do not have access to sanitation or electricity. In much of sub-Saharan Africa, Michael, my colleagues tell me that a child born today is more likely to go hungry than to go to school. In the power sector alone, the developing country's demand for capital over the next decade will be on the order of $100 billion. Yet many countries lack capital markets. They lack the legal and regulatory codes essential for attracting private investment. And perhaps most important, they lack the institutions that enforce them. They lack the management techniques to deliver basic health and education. They lack transparency and accountability. And they lack a well-targeted social program to compensate the poor for the loss of those subsidies. And far from it being a case of too strong a state, in many countries in Africa, the institutions are weak and the shortage of skills so great that private capital doesn't want to go in. These are the countries that desperately need knowledge and advice, as well as bank lending, so that governments attract rather than deter private credit. And that, in turn, means that more attention needs to be paid to the enabling role of the state, to the creation of a facilitating institutional framework. This is not about competition for subsidies and sweetheart deals. It is about creating the state institutions that can put the friendly into market friendly. Why? Because we know a weakened state doesn't necessarily mean strengthened market institutions. And we know that a minimum amount of institutional scaffolding is a crucial. Moreover, as a number of countries in East Asia have shown us, the problem of development is, in part, a problem of contractual relations between the state and the polity and among the key groups within the polity. Without political consent, very little is possible, and almost nothing is sustainable. We know, too, that in many developing countries, enormous work has yet to be done to reduce state subsidies, for example. In Tanzania, central government subsidies to state-owned enterprises equals 70, more than 70% of central government spending on education and 150% uh, of the central government on health. That from country to country, institutional reform means both a building down and a building up of the institutions. So let me come then to what the bank is doing and briefly come to a close. A substantial part of the World Bank's work in this area involves civil service reform public sector management, and public enterprise reform. Again, maybe Larry will tell us a little about what he taught us on privatizations when he was at the World Bank. These issues are central to how power is exercised. They are also crucial in order to maximize development. In Uganda, the bank has a civil service reform project 
that focuses on the reduction and the rationalization of the ministries and the building up of local government capabilities. In Malawi, a project to strengthen the capacity of the Department of Personnel Management and Training and design and implement a new accounting system. And in Georgia, the country, uh, a project to strengthen the municipalities. More recently, the bank is extending its work into new areas of support, areas where all of us are engaged in research together. Accountability, the rule of law, and transparency. In Venezuela and Bolivia, uh, we have, the bank is pioneering judicial reform, which Michael talked about before, strengthening the independence of the judiciary, increasing courtroom productivity and efficiency, and reducing the private sector costs of dispute resolution. Similar projects are planned for Peru, Ecuador, and Argentina. And on the research front, the bank is doing, with others, pioneering work, we hope, on political constraints, on the structure of incentives and rents, not only in the context of state-owned enterprise reform, but also public sector management reform and even budgetary allocations, such as those for basic education. Research programs run the gamut from the relationship between political institutions, leadership, and growth in East Asia to issues of governance and participation in Africa, from Social Security Administration reform in Latin America to the relationship between governance capacity and the successful implementation of adjustment programs across a range of countries. So when Michael says that his macro side, as opposed to his micro side, involves working with the international financial institutions, I think you could say that since neither of us exchanged views on our speeches today, it is in fact a partnership that shares a great deal. What does the research finally tell us? First, it tells us that we need to package the right institutions with the right policies. By themselves, even the right policies have been seen to fail unless they are juxtaposed with institutions that help to build political support. Second, the state has to pay particular attention to investing in human capital and in poverty alleviation. No country has been able to take off economically with less than a 50% literacy rate. Moreover, poverty reduction and investment in human resources are essential for building political consent. And the bank has a crucial role to play in enabling the poorest countries, which cannot attract private capital, to break out of what we might call a poverty equilibrium. Third, the state has a vital role to play in environmental protection, in designing macro and sectoral policies, and setting regulations and standards for sustainable growth. In the environment, the state can be important. The bank has an important part to play in fostering the synergy between economic growth and natural resource management, in putting the macro back into environment and showing how prices alone can do more for the environment than hundreds of regulations. Fourth, we need to recognize strategies to meet local conditions and political and cultural mores. Certainly the bank has not been in the lead in learning this, but we have learned it. Political consent is an essential component of reform and of institution building. Strategies will inevitably differ from country to country, but achieving that synergy between market-friendly policies and the enabling state should be the goal. And finally, we need to focus, as I said before, on the bottom-up institutional development, broadening participation and representation. So does this mean we've all become political economists? No, but perhaps that's what we should be doing. Certainly, if we are serious about raising the rates of growth and the quality of life, particularly for the poorest, we have to recognize that even the best designed free market approach without the right institutions in place cannot hope to operate effectively. And maybe that's what Marx was missing, Jeff. He, uh, if he'd gotten that right, he might not have gone off on such a tangent. Moreover, given the distance many poor countries are from achieving the institutional fundamentals, this may well be the most important challenge facing the bank in its economic research, and the bank is well placed for the task. The World Bank thrives on applied research, as you do here at the Institute. We work with our clients, we learn from experience, 
We combine that learning with new research, and we apply it again. The risk is not lack of zeal, but rather overcomplexity. If every project in each country becomes accountable for the panoply of lessons learned, participation, women in development, environmental sustainability, poverty alleviation, et cetera, we may become overwhelmed. It's certainly a lesson that Ernie Stern taught us at the bank. We need country strategies built from complex knowledge with projects that are manageable by human beings. We need patience and we need humility. Patience, because we now know that some of these successes will require a full generation or more to appear. And humility, because we know that however hard we try and however much success we achieve, we will continue to make mistakes. And humility is something we're learning at the World Bank. And lastly, we need partnerships. Partnerships on the ground, partnerships in the financial sector, and partnerships with uh, institutions like the Harvard Institute and with economists like Dwight Perkins. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica. The fourth and last speaker here at last is La Lawrence Summers, formerly the Nathaniel Ropes Professor of Political Economy at Harvard and now Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. Before joining the Treasury, as uh, Jessica's already said, Professor Summers was Vice President and Chief Economist at the World Bank, where he was in charge of the research program, among other things. Known for his work on fiscal policy, he has also contributed to the literature on growth and development. A graduate of MIT, Larry earned his PhD from Harvard. It's not generally known that Larry had his first experience in economic development with HIID in Jakarta in the early 1980s, when he was a consultant with our Indonesia tax reform project, and he played a pretty mean game of tennis in those days, too. In 1983, Larry became the first, became professor, uh, sorry, in 1983, Larry became professor at Harvard in the same year and at the same tender age, 29, as our first speaker, Jeff Sachs. They're both a bit older now, and now we'll listen to Larry Summers. All right. Thanks very much. It's good to be back at Harvard. I'm here to celebrate Dwight Perkins, to celebrate HIID, to celebrate what's happening in the developing world, and to worry a little bit about America's role in what's happening uh, in the developing world. I was thinking as I came here that I first met Dwight uh, just about 20 years ago when I first came to Harvard uh, as a graduate student. And I was thinking that in intellectual life, which is often so subject to fads, how resistant to those fads uh, Dwight Perkins has been. At a time when uh, Jeff Sachs and I used to sit in his apartment and try to figure out now what was a credit and what was a debit in the balance of payments. <laughs> and we weren't so quick to figure it out. Dwight was already thinking about economic development questions in China. That was a time when the term Pacific Century was not in anybody's mind. And yet he was already involved in training many of the people who have been so influential in bringing about that change to a Pacific Century. I've been struck in uh, my travels as uh, under Secretary of the Treasury and before that at the World Bank, uh, that uh, wherever I go, I meet people who say, I was at Harvard seven years ago as a fellow of HIID, as a fellow of the Kennedy School. I worked at HIID, and I worked with uh, Dwight Perkins. I don't think there are many Americans who, through their own efforts and through the efforts of the institution that they led, have had as large an impact on the economic development imp uh, effort around the, the world. It is absolutely staggering to travel around and to see the number of senior officials who regard the year or the two years or the three years that they spent here at this university as a formative and important influence uh, on uh, their lives. And without Dwight's efforts, I think there would have been a great deal less uh, of that.
Jeff, Mr. Chega, Jessica, have each in their way celebrated the profound change that is taking place in the world right now. It's interesting to think about uh, what uh, history books written about this 25-year period, this 30-year period, will say when they are written four or five centuries from now. I think there are only three things that it's plausible will figure in uh, those history books. The one everybody thinks of first, I think, is the least likely one to be prominent. And that is the end of the 50-year struggle between the so-called free world led by the United States and the so-called communist world led uh, by Russia. If you think about history books 500 written today, conflicts between major states 500 years ago are not the prominent stuff of those history books. A second possibility that I think will be more prominent is the fact that this was the period when man left the earth and went on the moon. That's unconnected with our subject uh, today. <laughs> I think. I think the story that will be dominant, certainly the story that we want to have be dominant, is that this was the quarter century in which half the planet got on a rapid road towards modern industrial life. Because if you think about uh, the fact that the places where several billion people live are now enjoying growth rates where standards of living more than double every 20 years, that is a change that potentially ranks, with, ranks in human history with the Industrial Revolution and the Renaissance if it is allowed to continue. I think your previous speakers have spoken well to what its crucial uh, requisites are. They are the recognition of the market as the best known liberator and organizer of human energy and human creativity. And they are the recognition that that market system cannot, as Jessica eloquently emphasized, function well without the skeleton provided by a strong state that can do only the thing that can do the things that only governments are able to do. But I think as we think about that revolution, we have to think not just about what goes on in developing countries, but about uh, what goes on outside developing countries and what goes on in the United States because of the United States' continuing unique role in the international system. I would suggest to you that the effective continuation of these trends towards market-based market development in all the developing world implicate almost every important economic interest, every important security interest that the United States has. It's there in our export uh, potential. Nearly 4% of our workforce now does work that contributes directly to exports that go to developing uh, countries. And we are the most successful economy in the world in selling to developing countries. But that, I think, is probably the least of the reason why this trend is so important for us. It is important for us in terms of the way the world system uh, evolves. If you think about the life choices of a child born in Santiago or Seoul or Shanghai today, and the life choices of such a child born just 25 years ago, you see that the capacity for human freedom has been magnified enormously. I am told, Dwight would know whether it's actually true or not, that 25 years ago, one in every seven women between the ages of 15 and 25 in Seoul was a prostitute. Progress means that things like that just aren't true anymore. We have a stake in the success in a much more direct way. I'm told that by the year 2000, more than one in every hundred adults on this planet will have AIDS. Whether how we manage that situation, how that situation is controlled, will have a great deal to do with the progress that we make 
in continuing this economic development effort. And if you think about how wars start, a very large fraction of them have their roots in economics. Think about how ethnic conflict has been managed in Malaysia with 9% a year growth, and in Africa, where growth has been stagnating. Think about the roots of World War I in the economic expansion of Germany that met closed markets, or of the roots of World War II in the Pacific. And you see the importance of not just fostering economic growth, but fostering the integration of developing countries. President Clinton has recognized this uh, very clearly. I was with him in the Oval Office on the night that he decided that he was prepared to make a substantial commitment of U.S. resources to address the Mexican financial crisis. And he said that night, you know, I am able to do this because this is Mexico and we have a 2,000 mile border. This could be happening in other places where as many or more people would be affected, where the consequences would be as great, and I wouldn't be able to do this alone. And that's why we need a global system that ensures that we can prepare to meet these kinds of crises because we have to meet these kinds of crises if we want to see this type of forward momentum continue. What can we as Americans do to make this progress continue? I'd suggest there are three critical things we have to contribute. Our ideas, our markets, and our money. Let me say a little bit about each one of them. Our ideas, that is the business that uh, HIID has been in so successfully for so many years. I would register only one mild dissent from what I heard my friend uh, Jessica say, and I'm really dissenting from something that I don't think she said, but an impression that uh, she might have left. And that is that sensible political balancing of these very difficult constraints was the key to success. No doubt it is key to success. But getting a whole set of complicated technical things right rather than wrong is also essential uh, to uh, success. Nations have been lost because people failed to sterilize capital inflows and outflows in the right way. Country governments have fallen because they didn't understand the arithmetic connection between budget deficits and current account deficits. Epidemics have continued because people didn't understand the basic relationships of epidemiology. And so as we emphasize the broad sweep of political ideas, let us not also forget the very important, very specific, and very practical kinds of knowledge that we develop, that we teach, that we spread in places like this. That American institutions like this spread, that American institutions uh, spread um, more directly through our efforts around the world at uh, technical assistance. It never figures in any discussion of competitiveness, but I would suggest to you that if you consider all the equities, that America's export, the exports of America's higher education sector, both financially and in terms of ideas, are probably the most important exports that this country has. Second, our markets. We have the most open markets in the world. The reason why the world has moved forward towards much more open markets for 50 years is because the United States has led the way. The reason why the world is still moving forward is because the United States is still pushing forward. That idea of open markets is under attack. There are people who say that somehow NAFTA was a bad idea because Mexico had a crisis. Let me tell you, NAFTA is much more important because Mexico had that crisis than it would have been if Mexico had not had that crisis. Because what NAFTA has done is lock in reforms, made sure that Mexico responded to that crisis 
by reinforcing the right things, privatization, liberalization, getting trade down, promoting exports, rather than taking the kinds of turns that Latin American countries too often have in uh, the past. If the world effort at trade liberalization is going to continue, there is simply no alternative to American leadership. If the progress that the major nations of Asia have made with double-digit growth rates, we didn't, that was an unheard of phenomenon in the history of the world 20 years ago. If that kind of progress is to be enjoyed for countries in any other part of this world, the trade system has to continue becoming more open. And that can only happen if the United States continues to push for it. Let me tell you, we have the most open markets in the world. Our markets are basically open. These trade agreements are massively in our interest even if you view the situation in purely mercantilist terms, because our markets are already open and others are not. There is no responsible alternative for this country but to continue the progress of liberalization. Let me conclude by just saying a little bit about uh, our financial assistance. Right now, the Congress is debating the foreign assistance bill. I'm going to talk about just one part of it. That is the portion that goes to the World Bank, to Ida, for its concessional window. Right now, a fight is on between the House version of that bill and the Senate version of that bill. The House bill ver Senate version of that bill is the more generous. It would meet about half of our $1.25 billion obligation. Failing to meet this obligation is simply crazy. We, our money, is levered in every way possible. It's levered because each dollar we contribute is matched by four to five dollars from other countries. It's, le it's levered because the World Bank has recourse to the market, and these are loans, not grants. In a real sense, this is walking around money for capitalism. This is grants to encourage policy conditionality, to bring down trade barriers, to promote trade liberalization to promote uh, privatization. We spent much more on defense before we won the Cold War. If we were to be devoting the same share of our income to defending this country that we were in 1985, not during a war, just in 1985, it would cost an extra $175 billion a year. Can anybody believe that this country cannot afford 1% of that figure, one and three quarters billion dollars, to maintain its leadership in the international development effort? And yet that is what is threatened right now. I believe that in the end, this country will do the right thing. We will heed the lesson of what we did wrong after World War I and what we did right after World War II. With Dwight Perkins freed of his administrative responsibilities, with Jeff Sachs uh, added to his already powerful voice the bully pulpit of the Harvard Institute for International uh, Development, with those of us who are in government uh, doing what we can I think there is an understanding that this is not a time when Franklin Roosevelt's idea that what we have to fear is fear itself is right. This is a time when what we have to fear is actually complacency. If these trends will somehow continue without our working hard to create them. And that is by no means a certain bet. And that's why continued lead American uh, leadership here at Harvard, in Washington, around the world is so essential. Thank you very much. All right, there is uh, 35 minutes, or there are 35 minutes left, and we will have discussion for a while. 
Anybody who'd like to ask, ask a question, would you come up to the microphone if you could, because the speakers can't see over this podium, at least to the right, I can tell you that much. And uh, Clive, do you want to start? in uh, many, many parts of the developing world, and specifically in Africa. Uh, I think one of the most interesting under-researched topics is the counter counterfactual of what would have happened in a number of African countries had the international financial institutions and bilateral donors not continued financial support, which has enabled corrupt dictators such as Moy in Kenya, uh, Ufwet Bwanyi in Ivory Coast, and uh, various other unsavory characters to stay in office. Uh, I, I would be interested in views of the panel as to whether, in retrospect, the, the uh, institutions should have been more forthright, should have withheld financing and uh, uh, exercised uh, a healthy influence on those situations, or whether, alternatively, they would have, by, by doing so, would have led to greater chaos, would have uh, introduced uh, armed con civil wars perhaps uh, earlier than they have in fact taken place. Thank you. Clive, do you have a preferred respondent to that question? I beg your pardon? Who do you want to answer that question? Oh, uh, I, I should think any member of the panel oh, might have a perspective. Like, I, I'd, I'd like, like to hear Michael, certainly, but I, I should think Jessica Einhorn, uh, Larry Summers, and, and uh, any of them. <laughs> Volunteer? Jessica? Let me just say that um, I don't, I and my colleagues at the World Bank don't need a counterfactual to uh, know you're right and agree with you about the importance of performance based lending. Uh, performance based in terms of policies and certainly performance based, as Michael was saying, in terms of governance and, uh, and transparency. Uh, so, I don't, I had actually never thought about the notion that the counterfactual might turn out to be positive. And that's probably a wrinkle that we, uh, that we should think through. But certainly, uh, if the thrust of your question was uh, the first part, which is you shouldn't throw away the dollars that are so hard to get, as Larry was telling us, uh, by giving it to places where it won't be used well, that's a lesson that's been learned. And in the use of concessional money in the World Bank, Ida, uh, the donors have all requested, and the bank has um, has uh, fully engaged in making sure that the funds are performance based and uh, and uh, that we don't repeat it. One last thing, it was the politics of the Cold War which intervened there, and uh, and that's a different issue, one that gets a little far afield from where we are. But it's not as if people didn't necessarily know, but there were some other political currents having uh, having an effect on the way aid flows went. Michael. Michael. Let me say this, um, two comments before I come to the counterfactual argument. Um, I think all of us who are in this business will at some point need to atone for the manner in which we view this whole question of the macroeconomic impact of corruption by sweeping it under the rug. I have not seen it as a priority area uh, within the field of scholarship. I have not seen any bilateral or multilateral donors that have wanted to confront it head on. And I feel, and I've not done it myself, as you know, otherwise you've heard about it. Uh, but I think it's time that we began to look at it. If I walk into the Bank of Boston tomorrow and want to borrow money, they'll want to know what credentials I have to use that money for the purpose that I have stated. Sometimes. They want to see my, oh, all right. A at least I want to look at my resume and at my credit record. Bottom line, why has it never been a policy among lenders within uh, the area of development to look at the track record of some of the leaders? How much money do they have in the Swiss bank accounts before and after lending? What is their track record? <laughs> when the records of uh, development agencies which are now in vaults and um, you know, not open to public scrutiny are finally opened, and those archives are finally opened, we'll see that what I suspect is the case that you know, this was swept under the rug. Number two, a counterfactual argument, basically a question of research. Again, I say we are working in a field here that we ought to look into closely 
the statistics and so on. At the outset, let me say this, that the argument that putting in money onto dictatorships and knowing that some of it is being squirreled away uh, is a way of stopping uh, a disaster from looming disaster from happening is simply not correct. Within the, the at the height of the Cold War, U.S. development aid per capita in Africa was concentrated in guess where? Sudan, Liberia, Somalia, Zaire. In other words, into these very countries where the dictators were preparing the countries for complete demise rather than dictatorship. Jeff Kirsten. Yes, thank you, uh, distinguished panel members and guests and colleagues. It's a pleasure for me to attend the symposium honoring Professor Perkins. As he was initially responsible for recommending my employment to HID, I appreciate it. <laughs> <coughs> my question is, uh, given the recent award of the Nobel Prize in Economics to Bob Lucas in Chicago, I wonder if the panel could comment on the power of positive thinking uh, and its implications on sustainable economic development. Volunteer. It must be Larry. <laughs> I can comment on Bob Lucas's Nobel Prize. I can comment on positive thinking, and I can comment on sustainable development. But I'm not sure I can provide a unified comment <laughs> on uh, on all three. Uh, look, I don't think there's any question that. Um, there has been a sea change in thinking uh, from the time when uh, Jeff and I were undergraduates uh, 25 years ago. It is only a small exaggeration to say that at that time, the drift of an Ivy League undergraduate education in macroeconomics was that it was good to have bigger deficits so you could have more aggregate demand, so you could have more employment. And that was the central thing you had to understand and there were these bad guys who thought different, but they were wrong. And they were not at all. And they weren't at all. And that was, that, was, that was the core message that was absorbed. And there's clearly been a change in the world's thinking. It's a change that's been brought about, um, I would say, uh, substantially because of experience because of the development of ideas of which Bob Lucas was a very important part. And I think because of a, gra of a widening of the focus beyond the United States, I think that uh, it, if people had thought to ask the question, the fact that they had 47% inflation um, in some months and a fair amount of unemployment in a number of Latin American countries at the time that that was being said, would have led to certain skepticism about uh, some of the prevailing doctrines of that time. But that question didn't come into focus. I think Professor Lucas's work had a great deal to do with bringing about uh, that uh, very important change uh, in our thinking, which is not to say that expectations are fully rational or to say that government policy uh, doesn't matter or to say that uh, macroeconomics and macroeconomic policy are not profoundly important. Thank you very much. Jeff, do you want to come? I guess I'll direct this mostly to Professor Summers, because uh, I believe you're one of the ablest people in our government today. You've made enormous contributions, both with your economic analysis and your, your eloquence on the behalf of the world's poor and disadvantaged. Uh, I had a mild disagreement with you several years ago in that I thought you were a little bit too sanguine about the uh, greenhouse effect. You were saying that we shouldn't uh, overreact to it. You were speaking at the Science Center uh, several years ago. Uh, there's an article uh, in uh, the New York Times yesterday about Rondonia. The Amazon forests are burning again. I wonder if you uh, are thinking about that problem. And I'd like to mention, I, I'm in general, I have a high approval for what the panel are doing, what the HAID and the World Bank are doing. Uh, I want to mention three critics, and perhaps you could react to them. Um, uh, Noam Chomsky at MIT has been very critical of the role 
of American business on human rights. And one situation he's been very much interested in is Timor, where the United States uh, is providing military aid uh, to Indonesia, and there's a case in the World Court about petroleum uh, that may be exploited by Australia in the Timor Gap, which uh, many people in the United Nations believe uh, should be considered a sovereign nation. Another critic uh, is President Li of Taiwan. Uh, ta uh, the Republic of China was our ally in World War II. Uh, many people are still troubled about the, the positions we have taken in regard uh, to democracy in China, and we don't want to turn uh, are back on the world's largest nation, but uh, many people are troubled about those human rights issues. And the last critic I want to mention is Georgi Arbatov, who was an advisor to Gorbachev, and um, uh, he's concerned about the impact on the poor uh, uh, and the pensioners uh, in Russia of a too simplistic a free market approach. Thank you very much. That's really more of an agenda than a question, but let's see if we can um, answer as much of it as possible. Larry? Uh, as far as the greenhouse effect, I've talked it over with the vice president, and he has set, and, and he has set me straight. <laughs> as far as um, East Timor, I'm not familiar with that situation. Uh, the China situation clearly involves a very, very difficult set of balances as the uh, debate surrounding President Lee's trip to Cornell uh, revealed, uh, I think one has to be very concerned about the distribution of income in Russia, as in many other countries. But I think that uh, the experience uh, in Eastern Europe uh, and the former Soviet Union uh, has largely borne out Jeff Sachs's initial view that uh, adjustment delayed is not only um, adjustment prolonged, but adjustment made more painful and more difficult for more people. Maybe I could say sure. a word about Mr. Arbatov, because he began his career for many decades as an advisor to Mr. Brezhnev, and uh, has uh, misplaced uh, his uh, criticism, which uh, is uh, very justified of uh, the events in Russia in the last three years. To a significant extent, the reformers lost a great deal of uh, their battle in Russia. The first reform prime minister was thrown out after a year. Some reforms have continued. But under the chaos of political infighting, one thing that's happened is that a huge amount of the assets of the society have been stolen and pocketed by very powerful groups of the old elite. The oil and the gas sector has somehow disappeared into private hands. <coughs> the banking sector arose from nothing to uh, several billion dollars of capital on the basis of <coughs> handouts, deliberate handouts from the central bank that were as corrupt as they were devastating macroeconomically. It's really important to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that that's not what economic reform is. The Soviet Union was ruled for decades by either the most ruthless or certainly together with the Nazis, the most ruthless gang of thugs that the world has seen in this century. And it's a sad truth that the end of the period, because this was an indigenous, powerful group of people, a lot of them are still around, still powerful, still fighting, and now rich. <laughs> they were rich before because the Communist Party in the last 10 years of its life was a shakedown operation, and they could skim income. They all became capitalists by learning that you could not only steal income, you could steal capital as well. That uh, actually gave you the present value, not just the flow. <laughs> So what's really important to understand is that we are witnessing an incredible social struggle and political struggle largely misconceived and misunderstood, including by the international institutions, including by our government, which was too slow at a crucial moment when there were real reformers in, and then happy to call people that weren't reformers reformers so that all of us got bad names in being linked up 
with the theft of tremendous amounts of the assets of the state. It's a painful, complex, unfinished story. Russia is a very unhappy place. What passes for economic reform there has been a disaster compared to what it should have been, compared to what it could have been. The public is deeply unhappy as all of us would be. They unfortunately think that property is theft, as Proudhon said, and it is. It has been in the life of Russia in the last three years to a substantial extent. And therefore, we still may have to reap the whirlwind because politics is unstable and society is unstable. And if they elect an extremist or if they get an extremist by non-electoral routes, we're going to be suffering this issue for a long time. We were deeply negligent, I'm afraid, in doing the best we could at the time we could. And now we want to believe that all will go well. Maybe it will. If there's any good news, it's that all the goodies that can be stolen have been stolen. Uh, a lot of the people that have them want to defend these rights now. Situations calming, at least temporarily, as uh, the good new capitalists go to work. And I'm speaking mainly about the, the really precious uh, jewels of the oil and gas sector. But I am afraid that we're still living on a powder keg. Unnecessary, not understood internationally, not appreciated, and one that could still come back to haunt us very seriously. Jessica? I'll pause for one moment because that was a, uh, because Jeff was talking about a serious matter on politics. I wanted to come in on the, on the question, however, on the, on the more technical one, which is the pensioners and the, uh, and the system. Designing the World Bank and, uh, and, and I'm sure that, I don't know this as a fact, but I would imagine the Harvard Institute has, uh, but the World Bank has taken a very major interest in the design of these uh, systems as an important element of uh, the macroeconomic system as well as the provision of insurance and the social safety net, all three areas being important uh, to development. And uh, the need to reform the systems that are being found in the, uh, in the transition economies I don't think is open to question. The question from, that we were getting from the floor was what's happening to the pensioners and I would simply say that there are a lot of lessons to learn from the richer countries about what you cannot do in terms of pay-as-you-go systems and neglecting the macroeconomic effects, the savings effects, the investment effects, the labor market effects of your social security systems. So there is need for technical assistance and for um, fundamental planning in designing these systems to make sure that you get both the right large economic effects on savings and the right effects in terms of uh, provision of the insurance and the social safety nets. Thank you. This side. Um, hi, my name is Navin Narayan, and I'm a freshman at the college. And um, my question is to anyone. Um, when we think of development, we think, of, um, we think in terms of health, um, theft, education, um, things of that nature. But my generation, when I think of development or when I think of problems um, in the world, I think of things like deforestation and desertification, and um, I, th I think these problems lead to many of the problems we talked about because they cause general shifts in population, especially in continents like Africa. Um, as the desert expands, people must move. This in turn causes theft and war, which in turn causes health problems. And I think this poses an economic challenge. Um, I think it's an economic, it takes in economic ingenuity to allocate money to really target the heart of the problem. So I was wondering um, how we all responded to this situation. Thanks. Well, we'll pick on Larry again on this topic. <laughs> Some of you are aware that Larry has a little bit of history in this area. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that uh, there's any question that if you had to list how people think uh, differently about uh, development uh, today uh, versus some time ago. You'd say there have been three important changes in the thinking. The market one we've been stressing, the centrality of uh, natural resources, and the centrality of environmental questions, and the importance of uh, 
popular participation and what I would call the whole bubble up aspect rather than the top down aspect. And I think if you look at what USAID is doing, I'm sure Jessica will not miss the chance to tell you how the World Bank has moved much more energetically uh, into the environment than it was before. I think that's absolutely appropriate. I think there is a bit of a tendency to understate um, the synergies between the good economic policy and the good environmental policy. Let me give you some uh, examples. Uh, several years ago when I was at the bank, we prepared an estimate suggesting that about 11 percent of the contribution of global greenhouse gases came as a consequence of below market subsidized energy prices in uh, developing countries. Jeff, uh, for years, uh, would tell the story at every stop of the uh, Polish factory that produced tropical flowers. And you would ask, why Poland tropical flowers? And the answer was that they were really very economic when coal sold for 10 percent of uh, the world price. Experience suggests that you would probably treat your dorm room better if you owned it rather than you rented it. And in just the same way, when farmers are given the title to their land, they treat it better too, and it is preserved much more effectively. And if you look around the developing world and you look at what happens as countries develop, you find uh, that they are much better able to address population and environmental uh, problems. Uh, if you look at uh, the capital city of countries with a per capita income of $7,000, it is much cleaner than countries with a per capita income of $3,000. And so I think that while there obviously are conflicts, it is a mistake not to, not to recognize that uh, good market policies and good environmental policies go together. And if anybody has any doubt about the basic wisdom of that, let them think about what happened in Eastern Europe and in Russia, mm -hmm. where you didn't have the profit motive, you had the worst environmental disasters in the history of this world. Thank you. Time is short. So what I'd like to do is take the next four questioners in line, ask your questions, if you can, as briefly as possible, and all at once, that is say one at a time, and then if the and panelists will, then, then, then you'll have a chance for your final, your final comments. You can pick up on the questions if you can, or if not, you'll have to all leave right. them. Here's okay? a general question. Um, if history teaches us anything, it is that investors in the industrial core are fickle. Whether Britain's building American railroads um, before World War I, Americans investing in German electronics before the Nazi takeover, um, there will come a turn of the business cycle when investors in the industrial core will see not the return but only the risk from helping to invest in the developing world. In that day, it will be more difficult to maintain policies of development virtue when you no longer have the capital inflow necessarily following every step toward reform. What should governments in the industrial core, international organizations, development think tanks do against the day when the business cycle turns and when private capital for development is no longer abundant but scarce. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to focus my comment on Mexico as an example of many examples you were talking about in your discussions. I've heard a lot of discussion between what we've seen in the past, a state-run economy and a free market economy. As we look f forward, I think the issues aren't one or the other. It's what kind of market economy. Uh, particularly in Mexico, I wanted to know if some of you could speak to the issue of the Zapatista movement. That I don't think it was a coincidence, obviously, that their rebellion was timed with the inauguration of NAFTA. I also um, would like your comments. Do you see the Zapatista as the exception or more the rule of what will be emerging as one of our responses to the kind of market liberalization taking place? Um, what's good for Mexico or what's good for America might not be good for a particular area. Uh, Walmart is an example that comes to mind for me. Walmart is good for a U.S. national account. It's bad for Northampton. So what kind of um, market economy and growth that we promote under the policies that you're advocating, I'm hoping you can provide some reflection on that. Thank you. Thank you. Ben? Um, one of the things that I can imagine is that uh, there's some kind of consensus here that market reforms are very important and a critical first step in getting economies back on the road. But recently I read a disturbing article by Paul Krugman 
we tried to look at these, uh, the, the impact of these market reforms and quantify them. And uh, his, I guess his analysis was that they really don't count for much in terms of uh, the dollar amount that they actually buy you. And perhaps uh, economies of agglomeration or uh, speculative capital flows or things like this that lie outside of market reforms perhaps might be much more important. So I'm kind of uh, curious as to how you would respond to that. Thank you. And the last question. Uh, hi, I'm from Senegal, which explains some of the concerns I have. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Summers about um, a question about um, a memo, I think, an internal memo that at the World Bank where I think, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not, I'm, no, no, I'm not asking this question in any vindictive way. I'm just um, really, I really want to hear from the author of the memo uh, about his position on that particular subject. Uh, let Mr. Summers explain that to us. Um, Mr. Sachs, I wanted to ask you, uh, in this growing consensus that you talked about um, in implementing market reforms, what happens when there is um, resistance at the local level uh, to some of these uh, some of these processes. Again, I'm not, in, and I'm not thinking only about Africa, I'm thinking about Poland. Uh, when you've seen Poland recently, I think the communists are coming back uh, to power. Is that a direct res result of your efforts there? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ms. Einhorn, I want to ask you this question about the World Bank. Uh, you, you know, Senegal has not, is in right now in its worst shape probably um, it has ever been economically. And I would like to ask you if um, from Senegal and spreading to other countries, the World Bank is becoming de facto the real government because I think you mentioned a number of other areas you are uh, starting to apply your expertise, including legal process and, um, and so on. And Mr. Chege from Kenya, I want to ask you, um, in the, um, we talk about ideas, and I think there is a, a, a right there also a consensus about how important ideas are and, um, for leadership or for real activity on the ground. And you mentioned the technocrats. And from your experience, how many of those ideas that you have implemented or that colleagues of yours have implemented in Kenya are of local origin? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's, <laughs> let's uh, go in reverse order then and have Larry start and go down the table in that way. Okay? <laughs> That's what you get for coming. Your arrest comes after, Larry. <laughs> Rather than try to respond uh, specifically to all of those questions, let me try to respond for a moment to what I think is the impulse uh, behind them. I know I speak for myself, and I think I speak for others, when I say that when we advocate market approaches, when we call for some reduction in the traditional amount of government control, we aren't doing that because we've got some fixation without making our textbooks true. And we aren't saying it because we've got some a priori sense that it has to be better that way. We're saying it because of our reading of what the lesson of history has been. That however well-intentioned policies directed at trying to direct and control things in more central ways end up having very painful consequences and having painful consequences most profoundly for those who are least well off. If you go to your country, Senegal, it indeed involved many of the questions that uh, we've referred to here. For many years, your country's exchange rate was maintained at a level that uh, market-based thinkers thought of as uh, inappropriate, uh, as overvalued. And it was very important to the elite in your capital city, 
And to a certain number of those who were fortunate enough to get jobs in the industrial sector and to be able to import substantially, that it be maintained in that way. And they were able to maintain tremendous political pressure for that. What it meant was that those without a voice, those in rural areas who farmed, didn't get the price that they would otherwise get by selling their products. It meant they were forced to farm more intensively and deplete the soil. It meant there was more pressure on them to cut down the trees and to deforest the society. Moving to a more market-based system has liberated that uh, economic uh, energy in important parts of uh, French Africa. You can tell similar stories in uh, other places. On balance, the right reading of economic history, in my view, is very clear that if the only thing you care about is the quality of life for the poorest people in developing countries, the case for moving towards more market-based systems is stronger, not weaker, than if you care about the broader set of uh, imperatives. And so it is not a case of uh, ideology. Uh, I think the ultimate uh, values that what's most important is what happens to the poor are the same for almost everybody in this room. It's a question of what the right reading of the experience is. Thank you very much. Jessica? Yeah, thanks. Uh, let me refer to our uh, young undergraduate from Harvard on the environment issue and simply say that the, uh, that the World Bank is the world's largest lender at this stage to developing countries for the environment. I think it's quite well known that we came to it rather late, but we've come to it uh, with a grand, there you are, with a grand embrace. Um, environmentally sustainable development is one of the bank's fundamental objectives now. And in the fields of lending, environmental assessments, in national action plans, which means you sit down with a country and you look and you try and figure out what you should do from the smallest to the largest areas and map out the environmental areas and priorities, as well as the prices uh, and other kinds of effects. Those are all central. And just to throw numbers at you, I think you're probably getting a fair share of them. In the three fiscal years, in the three years, I should say, since the Rio Earth Summit, the bank has committed um, a record of more than five and a half billion dollars, if that has any meaning, in new loans to strengthen countries' management of the environment. And indeed, um, $10 billion has been uh, committed over the last decade for 140 environmental projects. So if environment is an area of interest, um, please do look into what the bank is doing. Um, there's lots of research on it. There's lots of activity. There's lots more to learn. Um, and, there's, um, and, uh, and it's a fundamental objective. On the other questions, um, as I started to listen to them, uh, Mike and others, I, I had quick answers on each. Investors are fickle, business cycle, and my response is, yes, but you know we've done lots of studies and there are certain macroeconomic policies that mean that the investors stay with you. And the newest stuff that's coming out from the International Monetary Fund and others about when should you have liberal capital flows and when shouldn't you and what kind of flows, short term versus long term. Similar sorts of feelings about um, the market economy along the lines of what Larry said. On Senegal, I had an, amazing, uh, an immediate reaction. No, no, it's partnership and ownership. And as Jim Wilkinson, as president of the World Bank, said, um, they're not our projects. They're the Malawi projects. They're not our projects. They're the Senegalese projects. So I have quick answers. But I think I'd rather end on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a frank and honest, uh, but perhaps more uh, respectful note which is simply to say that they are, in fact, excellent questions. And they're not questions that you can do in three minutes. Um, they're questions for debate and discussion. And hopefully our coming here is a testimony to the respect we have for that process of debate and discussion that goes on here every day. So that's my response for today. And I'll see some of you after this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jessica. Michael? Um, let me begin by saying something about um, uh, the, the question that was raised by the gentleman about uh, the problem in uh, Chiapas and, uh, and the Zapatistas in Mexico, and try to generalize that a little more and say that concurrently with the moves in economic and political liberalization in an awful lot of developing countries, you're seeing these so-called movements of rage, movements that dissent 
uh, from economic liberalization, political liberalization, the opening up process. It's not just uh, resurgent and very reactionary nationalism that you see in some parts of Eastern Europe, uh, Islamic, Islamic fundamentalism in, in, um, in parts like, um, in sections of, um, of my own continent. Um, and I believe that although it may be convenient to blame the World Bank and the IMF for having introduced reforms in this, I think when the chips are down, we've really got to look at our own societies ourselves and ask ourselves why it is that we allow some groups within our countries to be so totally excluded, not just from the sharing of economic benefits, but also from the process of political representation. Because I don't see any other way of addressing this problem. And I, and I think when I mention questions of leadership and the capacity to integrate different factions with different ideas, with different political views, and mention South Africa, this is what I was getting to. Um, the question of, um, from my Senegalese uh, colleague on the World Bank and uh, the collapse of, what he called the collapse of the economy in, in Senegal, and uh, whether I thought the ideas in, in Africa uh, not being of local origin or of any violence. Firstly, to underscore what uh, Laudus Samas has just said, an awful lot of the problems in French-speaking West Africa had to do, like it or not, with the fact that they insisted on a fixed exchange rate between 1945 and 1993, of, uh, you know, linked to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the French, which obviously, as you would expect, a textbook case made it much, much more profitable and much more um, interesting to import rather than to export. I'm not in agreement with you, and I was in Senegal, um, this is October, I was in Senegal in August that the economic situation is disastrous for everybody. I would say that applies much more to Dakar, the capital, than it does to the countryside, because with the devaluation now, what is happening is that cotton producers, and, uh, or rather uh, um, groundnut producers in Senegal are doing much, much better than they ever did. It is the urban areas uh, accustomed over the years to consumption of quality burgundy and champagne, uh, and I have to pay for it five more times than they used to do. I look more closely to Burkina Faso, and, my, and the, the minister is for planning is right here with us this evening, and what is happening, for example, to beef production in the Sahel, that's, that's uh, Burkina Faso and Mali, after the devaluation of the CFR. Traveling in these countries myself in the 80s, it was always the case that in the hotels you had beef from, from France because of the, you know, you know, the European um, common agricultural policy and subsidies of food in that, in, in that part of the world. And from Argentina, the beef wasn't being imported from those areas. Now with devaluation, it's all of a sudden profitable for Ivorians and Senegalese to consume beef from the interior. That's from, from, uh, from Mali. And, uh, and, and, uh, and Burkina Faso, which is good for a list of producers in those countries. It may be bad for France and bad for Argentina, but let them take care of that. Uh, let me talk about um, the other problem, I think, with respect to Senegal, and I think this is a problem that affects all our countries seriously, and that is laxity in macroeconomic discipline. Senegal has had in place, over the last six or seven years, macroeconomic problems that, macroeconomic problem that seldom, if ever, met the targets. Uh, in capacity to control money supply and fiscal expenditure. That explains the lapse and the difficulties that ordinary people, including a lot of poor people in Dakar and in the countryside have experienced. And I think this is a problem that the, with the government, not just in Senegal, but in the continent as a whole that one has to look. How many of these ideas originate fr from, from Africa? Maybe not all, but some definitely. But in the end, the issue is this. What kind of ideas do you want to, ori to, to originate domestically? Incidentally, I see that issue being raised in this country as well. Oh, the gut, those foreigners out there in the gut want to impose on us what they say that is good for the international and global trading system. Let's be very careful about two kinds or two levels of ideas here. One is the objective reasoning of the kind that Larry Summers just said. 
And that is, if you're profligate with a money supply and fiscal deficits, you're going to pay for it, and people are going to get poorer. And that, if you're not producing and there's a lot of demand, prices will go up. There is nothing foreign about this. It just happens to be a fact of life, much as the fact that the earth is round. And some people will try to convince you it is flat because it is popular. It used to be popular in the Middle Ages, by the way. That they, but that did not make it right. Um, second, the question of uh, local origin. I think the marrying of these universalistic principles with the local context is what, uh, if you ask me and, 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 asked and, and um, contradicted me on that, I would gladly accept that we have not developed a capacity of how to break the threshold of marrying uh, these ideas, the technical ideas, with the local demands. This is a challenge that faces all of us, and I was hoping that in my presentation I was making that clear. Thank you very much, Mike. Jack? 